recurrent regression methods are almost like the complete opposite of our linear methods, okay? So um, linear models, uh, even those that we have um, expanded based on things like basis expansions or polynomial powers or whatever, um, they have high bias, right? And by bias, I mean that as the person using the linear methods, if I'm applying a linear method on a problem, I'm already pre-specifying that the data can be modeled by a linear function or a linear function of some basic set of basis functions, right? Now, the, in contrast, in kernel methods, we are not even going to bother thinking about what kind of um, underlying functional relationship there is uh, for that um, data, right? And what kernel methods do is that they basically just fit many, many different models to each of the data points. And um, for, for using the observations that are very close to that point, right? And then you, by doing so, uh, I, we will then actually use that same distance metric to basically make predictions of features that fall close by to that data point, right? So the way that kernel methods work is using uh, some form of localization function. Uh, localization function just means that how much weight do I give a data point that's sitting exactly on top of the point that I want to estimate, and how much um, weight do I want to give a data point that is a certain distance d away from that uh, um, uh, prediction, okay? So um, typically the kernel function only has a single parameter and that parameter is basically to define the width of the neighborhood, okay? And um, there is no model. The model essentially is your entire training data set. In other words, you are using your training data to make predictions on whatever data that comes next and you are not trying to assume that there's some functional underlying relationship within that uh, training data, okay? Um, it is, they are very effective, okay? There are actually a lot of applications where a kernel method will give you fantastic predictions, right? But the problem with this is, of course, since there is no underlying functional representation, you actually have no insight into how the prediction is being made, okay? All right, so let me start with the simplest uh, kernel method of all, and you, uh, once you actually go through that simplest uh, kernel method, you will actually understand how it works, right? And the simplest kernel method is called k-nearest neighbor, right? Now, uh, I want to distinguish this from k-means, okay? So k-nearest neighbors and k-means are completely different things, okay? k-means is for unsupervised learning. k-nearest neighbor is actually a form of supervised learning. It's just that your, um, your, you are now making that prediction based on a kernel, right? So the k-nearest neighbor algorithm is actually the simplest possible method for prediction. It is even simpler than your linear regression, right? Simple, linear regression, you still have to do fitting. Um, k-nearest neighbor, you don't actually need to do any fitting at all. Uh, what you are going to say is that basically the k-nearest neighbor is such that we just take the average of the k-neighbor's nearest neighbor and that's basically my estimate, right? And that's all there is to it, right? So, um, and the prediction tends to be bumpy. In other words, what this means is that as you move your neighborhood from one area to the other, uh, that tends to actually uh, create a sharp jump in your prediction, okay? So, um, how does this work, right? So basically, let's see, you have all these data set, and I have a new uh, data point, x naught, that I want to predict, and what I'm going to do is that I'm going to take x naught and I'm going to look at um, plus minus a certain distance from x naught, all these data points, what the uh, actual values of some property it is uh, they are, right? And basically I'm going to take all the data points that fall within this neighborhood and I'm going to just take the average of that data point and say that's the predictor value and that's it. Now, how does this equivalently work in materials? You can imagine that, for example, let's say I want to predict the property of a specific material and I go to predict, let's say, the bulk modulus from, say, the boiling point. Simple, right? One for one kind of um, estimation. What I'm going to do is that I'm going to look at 
all the bulk modulus of data points that have the boiling point very close to my uh, actual material that I'm interested in. And I'm going to say the average of that bulk modulus is basically the bulk modulus of my um, new material that I do not know the boiling point for. Okay? That's basically what, how the k-nearest neighbor algorithm works. Now, um, the problem with k-nearest neighbor is, of course, if I, let's say, I just shift the data from just slightly to the left or right by a little bit, I'm going to lose uh, one data point here or uh, lose another data point here or gain another data point here. So, and what that does is that it introduces a discontinuous change in my prediction, okay? So the prediction is bumpy, okay? Now, um, you can always uh, adapt the k-nearest neighbor. So instead of just using the simple k-nearest neighbor where you t just take the average, uh, by taking the average, what you're essentially saying is that anything that falls within that uh, neighborhood, I'm going to give it equal weight, right? So you can modify that by using what is called weighted kernel. So in a weighted kernel, uh, you basically apply uh, something like this uh, yellow um, function over here, and that function will go to zero at the edges of the kernel. So in other words, points that are much closer to my actual predict, uh, my prediction uh, feature will be given a high weight and points that are further away from my prediction, uh, prediction target would actually uh, have a lower weight. And eventually, of course, at the edge of the prediction, you will have a zero weight, okay? So in this way, what, what, you, what, what will happen is that now you're smoothing out your predictions, okay? You no longer have a sharp jump uh, when you actually move your, um, uh, move your kernel from uh, one location to the other, right? So if you look at this comparison, uh, so in, in the um, k-nearest neighbor algorithm, you basically have this um, yellow square, which is an equal uniform weight across all the data points. And this green line shows you what is the predicted value for each of the uh, x naught as you move x naught from uh, left to right, right? And you can see that this green line is very, very bumpy, okay? While if you look at this, um, weighted kernel average, you have this uh, very nice uh, smooth prediction curve, okay? And that's the difference, right? And of course, this um, kernel function, there are many, many different kinds of kernel functions you can use. Um, so uh, there's something called an Apachnachnikov uh, kernel, which basically has this functional form over here, um, which is uh, D, which, which takes the D of the absolute of uh, X minus X naught divided by the width parameter lambda, so remember, in all cases, uh, in most kernel regression methods, this is the key parameter you have to specify, which is the width of the kernel. And this uh, function d basically has this form, which is 3 quarter 1 minus p squared. And uh, your t is, of course, this number over here, right? So um, there are also other kernel functions you can use, but uh, this is one of the most uh, popular kernel functions uh, that is used uh, for um, regression. Okay. Now, um, no matter which um, smoothing method you use, there's always one parameter lambda that determines essentially the width of the neighborhood, right? So obviously, if you are having a huge lambda, what you are saying is that I'm going to take the average of a much wider area, or I'm going to take the weighted average of a much wider area. While if I choose a very small lambda, then I am going to choose the average or the weighted average of a very small uh, area, okay? Now, um, the larger the lambda value, the higher the bias, okay? So kernel methods are um, interesting in this sense, right? You can actually tune the bias of your, uh, and variance of your model based on this one parameter. So you can imagine if I am choosing an infinite value of lambda, in other words, I'm choosing the entire data set as my neighborhood, then essentially what I'm doing is that I'm just saying no matter where the data falls, I'm taking the average of the data set and this is my prediction, right? So that, that of course, is very high bias, okay? Uh, but if I choose a lambda that is too small, maybe what will happen is that I actually only have my first nearest neighbor as my prediction. So it is then very um, noisy, right? If that one value that I measure is wrong, then I will make a wrong prediction, right? So 
this lambda essentially controls that uh, trade-off between um, that amount of bias you have and the um, uh, variance that you actually see in your data. Okay. Um, so at the 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 metric we know is actually um, increases uh, the local density. So in fact, as your local density increases, basically what happens is that your bias decreases. What this simply means is that if I'm taking an average of more data points, then uh, the, the the I have a bit more confidence in the results. Okay. Now, um, as I mentioned, um, the the Epanachnikov uh, kernel is one of the most commonly used. Uh, it is uh, quite compact, but uh, like I said, there are actually different kinds of kernels you can use. So there's another one called the tricube kernel. Uh, tricube because it is one minus t cubed to the power, of, uh, and then you take the cube of that. Okay. Um, it's also another uh, compact kernel. Uh, compact just means that it is not infinite extent. Okay. So compact means that it actually goes to zero at some finite value, right? Um, it is also, fr uh, this tri-cube kernel is uh, a bit flatter and it's also differentiable at the boundary. And of course, uh, for non-compact kernels, we have always that kernel that everyone loves so well, which is your Gaussian distribution, right? So this plot actually compares the three um, types of kernels. So as I mentioned, a, a compact kernel just means that there is actually a finite value in which the kernel goes to zero and after outside of the outside of the region so this is your uh, Epanachnikov uh, kernel your tricube kernel is this green one it is a bit flatter at the top uh, it actually goes down to zero uh, quicker and then you have your Gaussian kernel uh, over here and in all cases what you're controlling essentially is the width of the kernel with some uh, smoothing parameter lambda and in the case of the Gaussian it's basically just your uh, variance of your Gaussian distribution Okay. All right. Um, so all these are actually within the um, scikit-learn uh, um, neighbors um, package. Okay. So in scikit-learn, if you import, uh, from the neighbors package, you can include uh, import what is called a k-nearest neighbor regressor. Uh, there's also a k-nearest neighbor um, classifier, and uh, basically, you need to specify what's the number of neighbors you want to take the average of, and then basically that gives you your prediction. Okay? All right. <clears throat> um, any questions regarding k-nearest neighbors and the different kinds of kernels? No, right? Okay, k nearest neighbors is one of the most intuitive ways in which we do machine learning on a day to day basis, right? We, for example, if we want to predict, let's say, what are the voting preferences of a certain set of people living in California versus people living in Ohio, the easiest way is to take the people living in California and take the average, and then that's my prediction, right? So that's uh, that's essentially is how k-nearest neighbor work. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, so we can actually also correct, um, uh, modify our k-nearest neighbor algorithms to instead um, use local linear and polymor polynomial regression to essentially correct some of the bias at the boundary regions. But of course, that introduces a bit more variance, right? So. How does this work, right? So uh, remember, when we actually just take our k-nearest neighbors, uh, what we are essentially just doing is taking some average or weighted average of the points within uh, this area. So instead of doing that, what we can do is that we can continuously fit a regression model to each set of data, right? So for instance, let's say if I want to predict the uh, data in within this region, what I'm going to do is that I am going to take all the data that falls within this region, I'm going to fit a linear regression model within this region, and then I'm going to use that linear regression model within this region, and then when I move on to a new area, I'm going to refit another linear regression model and then uh, do another uh, fit, right? And this is basically somewhat similar to the um, cubic spline fitting that we talked about, okay? So, um, so 
for higher dimensional data, especially, um, local linear regression is actually somewhat preferable to um, the local constant fit, okay? Be especially because um, we need to extrapolate within uh, that region, or interpolate or extrapolate within that region uh, as well, okay? So um, typically this is usually used to interpolate within a region of the feature space uh, such that you actually get uh, smooth uh, predictions within that feature space, right? All right, <clears throat> now um, another way of um, doing kernel regression is using, doing what is called kernel density estimation. Now, kernel density estimation, essentially what you're trying to do is to estimate the probability distribution function of your data, okay? So um, the way that you do this is that you basically uh, estimate the probability distribution by taking the number of points, um, you of course apply some function to it, and then um, your data points will fall within some uh, um, region, and then you divide by the total number of data points, and that gives you your um, probability density, uh, density estimate, okay? So um, the way that you do this is usually, uh, using what is called a smooth uh, Parsons estimate, in which you basically just sum up um, the, uh, the kernel for every single data point that you have, okay? And the kernel that you use is typically uh, the Gaussian uh, kernel, okay? So um, it's easier for you to visualize this rather than trying to understand the math of this, okay? So um, it's actually not very different, okay? So basically, let's say I'm measuring data points that are uh, with these lines over here, these, all these lines over here, okay? And I want to know what's the underlying probability distribution function of my collected data, right? Now, the way that you do this is that I'm going to fit one Gaussian over here for each of this data point. I'm going to fit one Gaussian here, and put another Gaussian here, I'm going to put another Gaussian here, and I'm going to just sum up all my Gaussians, okay? And then after some normalization, basically what I get is this uh, smooth looking curve over here, right? Similarly, uh, if I take uh, the uh, no CHD data, I'm going to get this uh, distribution over here, right? And the, the usefulness of this can be seen in this particular plot. So uh, this is obviously uh, trying to um, look at the uh, systolic blood pressure and look at whether the differences in the distribution of your uh, blood pressure actually explains whether someone has CHD or not, right? And what you can see is that the distribution of the uh, CHD um, uh, patients are actually very different from the distribution for someone with no CHD, right? So um, the answer here is, of course, yes, if you measure someone with this uh, very high blood pressure, it is possible that they can have and not have CHD, but at the same time, it actually uh, gives them uh, you can actually use it as a probabil probabilistic assessment of whether uh, someone has CHD, okay? So, um, this kind of kernel has also been used in material science for um, interatomic potential development. So, for those of you who do not know what an uh, interatomic potential is, an uh, interatomic potential is basically a parameterization of the potential energy surface of your uh, system of atoms uh, as a function of some um, positions of the atoms. And in machine learning interatomic potentials, basically what people do is that they take the local environment around each atom, and then they encode them in local environment fingerprints, and then they associate that local environment fingerprint with the calculated energies and forces on the system as using machine learning algorithms, okay? So for those of you who have done your Nano 110, which is for computational modeling of materials, when you run your MD simulations, you are using uh, interatomic potential to run the MD simulation. This is basically the modern version of the interatomic potential where you actually use machine learning to construct interatomic potential rather than the traditional way where you basically have fixed functional forms and you fit it to some um, uh, data, okay? So uh, one of the um, interatomic potentials uh, machine learning interatomic potentials are what are what is called the Gaussian approximation potential. Um, uses what is called a smooth overlap of atomic positions, and uh, that 
smooth forward line of atomic position is essentially just a Gaussian kernel applied to the uh, distances between atoms. Okay, and uh, using that, you can actually construct a fairly accurate intolerant potential that actually works uh, very well uh, with very uh, high accuracy in terms of the energies and forces uh, compared to the ones that you actually calculate using first principle methods such as uh, DFT. Okay. <coughs> Okay, now um, kernel methods can also be used for classification. So we already covered class, uh, linear methods for classification earlier. So um, as I mentioned, for each of the class, we can, from the training data, we can actually determine the um, kernel density estimate. In other words, the probability distribution function for your data. And we can also estimate the class pyro, which is the probability of whether something is in class J or not, right? Now. Um, for classification, we can actually, uh, we, we, as you recall, one of the ways that we can perform classification is using uh, Bayes' theorem to calculate the posterior probability of whether something is in class J given the observed data, right? And um, from Bayes' theorem, we know that the probability that something is in class J given the, uh, given the observed data point is just equals to the product of the um, prior distribution with the uh, probability distribution uh, for that class divided by the sum of the same quantity for all the different classes, okay? And of course, what you will do is that you do this for all your k, k different classes and you take the maximum probability, so the one with the highest probability, and you say that, well, that is my classification for this data point, right? Now, um, if you only need to perform classification, you don't actually need to do the full kernel density estimate because um, very often what you will need to do is that you just need to know the decision boundaries, right? So for example, uh, let's say if you look at this data set, okay, I can do a kernel estimate and this is my uh, kernel estimate and let's say my class priors are equal, right? So let's say between these two classes, I have a 0 0.5, 0 0.5 chance of being in either class, okay? So I know that my decision boundary is going to be at this point, right? So this is my decision boundary. If it, something falls um, in this region, I'm going to classify as this class. If something falls in this region, I'm going to classify as this class. I don't actually need to know that this is my uh, this prior distribution for uh, my data point, okay? So um, it is a way that you can do it, but it is not like the, uh, it's not actually necessary if you want to uh, just estimate the um, class classification, okay? All right. <clears throat> now, um, I'm gonna come to the uh, one final um, kernel density estimate, uh, kernel estimation approach, which is called naive base, right? Now. Despite the name naive base, it sounds very a bit derogatory. Okay, um, it is actually one of the most popular, and uh, it often outperform much more sophisticated uh, alternatives in terms of making uh, predictions. Okay, so the way that naive base work is that um, let's say I all my um, data points are some function of my um, features, right? So remember my features is in general more than one features and my features more often than not, they do have some correlation with one another, right? So there is some relationship between some of my features. Now in naive base, what we are essentially saying is that I am not gonna care about any correlation between features at all. I'm gonna assume that all my features are independent Okay, so what is going to happen is that because my features are independent, my um, kernel densities are now not mixed together. I can actually count, uh, describe all my kernel densities as just a product of kernel densities for each of that um, data uh, for each of each feature. Okay, so in other words. If let's say I want to do the naive base estimate of my bulk modulus with respect to boiling point, melting point, electronegativity, I'm not gonna consider the correlation between all those variables. What I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna do a 1D kernel estimate 
of my bulk modulus with respect to melting point. I'm going to do a 1D kernel estimate of my bulk modulus with respect to boiling point. And I'm going to do a 1D kernel estimate of my bulk modulus with respect to my um, electronegativity. And because the um, kernel density estimates are now um, a product, they are actually separable. Okay? What this simply means is that if you take the log of the probability of being in class L versus the probability of being in class K, uh, essentially what you, that product then becomes a summation because you're taking the log. And essentially what happens is that this um, log uh, probability, now um, log probability ratio now becomes an um, additive uh, model. Okay? What is called a generalized additive model for each of the variable in turn. So essentially, now I have a summation of variable of one feature. Okay? So there's one, one um, function for my melting point, there's one function for my boiling point, there's one function for my electronegativity. It is, but there is no functions that makes multiple variables in one function. Okay? So this is why it's called a generalized additive model. Now, um, so uh, there's a later lecture on uh, GAMS we, where we'll go through this in a bit more detail. But uh, using this approach, we can actually uh, construct um, fairly good uh, prediction models, okay? So, <clears throat> all right. Now, um, another way that we can um, do kernel, kernel uh, fitting is also uh, using radial basis functions, okay? So, we can treat the kernel functions themselves as our basis functions. So uh, this is basically my kernel function, which is uh, some function of the distance between data points divided by a width parameter. And essentially, I can uh, do a prediction based on uh, expansion of my um, f of x in terms of these basis functions. And we can treat them as a linear uh, combinations of these uh, radial basis functions. Okay. Now again, like I said, uh, a Gaussian is a very common choice for D. And usually what we'll do is that we'll optimize that um, parameter using some least squares approach. So uh, this, if you recall, this is how we actually go about doing our fitting for our um, XRD patterns, right? Remember where we actually have Gaussian distributions and we are essentially trying to treat it as a summation of Gaussians and then we are uh, trying to figure out what are the parameters beta that actually gives us the optimal fit to our observed uh, spectrum. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, all right. Um, I think we have time to finish this. Okay. So um, the last kind of um, kernel um, estimation method that I want to talk about are what are called mixture models. Mixture models just simply means that I'm going to assume that the data is made up of a mixture of data drawn from different distributions. Okay? So in other words, um, my f of x is equal to some summation of um, a, a series of uh, um, distributions. And uh, there's some, uh, pref uh, some, <coughs> some um, coefficient associated with each of those uh, distribution. Again, a Gaussian mixture model is uh, by far the most common choice, okay? Be just simply because from the central limit theorem as well as in most natural processes, you do have some Gaussian noise associated with your data collection, okay? Now, um, if your covariance matrices are constrained to be scalars, then this is basically no different from your radial distribution function, uh, radial basis expansion, uh, but um, here, what we are saying essentially is that the matrix, uh, the covariance matrix uh, need not be a scalar. It can be actually a, a matrix, okay? Um, you can, usually the Gaussian mixture methods are fitted using uh, some maximum likelihood or expectation uh, maximization approach. Uh, this is actually going to be covered in the next lecture. And um, the way that you calculate uh, whether op the observations is in one class or the other is that you are going to essentially use your um, uh, similar to your base uh, theorem approach. You basically calculate that 
uh, alpha m times that uh, that um, mixture for that being in uh, particular mixture m divided by the summation across all your um, mixtures. Okay, so this is very often used in spectroscopy analysis. So just to show you an example of how you do this, all right. So this is actually um, a work that was published that uh, they were analyzing coherent anti-Stokes uh, Raman scattering, or what is called CAS, okay. And uh, CAS is basically used for chemical composition determination, okay. And um, it is a way of collecting such data very rapidly, right, compared to other kinds of uh, Raman scattering methods. Now, um, for, to analyze the scar spectral, basically what they do is that they use a, a Gaussian mixture to basically fit to the uh, spectra that it was collected. And then using uh, that uh, mixture of Gaussians, they can then uh, determine what kind of chemical composition uh, you have inside the mixture. Okay. All right. Um, let me go to the example. So this is the notebook for um, our lecture six on kernel methods, okay? And uh, what we are going to do is that we are going to use a set of data that we already worked with previously. We are going to use our elemental data set. And we are going to try to predict the bulk modulus from our um, features, right? And just to recap what those features are, we are trying to predict bulk modulus from things like what's the melting point of the element, What's the boiling point of the element? What is the atomic number of the element? The polling electronegativity of the element and the atomic radius of the element, right? So um, the data is on GitHub, so you can actually just give it the URL and Pandas actually very nicely. You can just automatically grab the data from that URL and pass it as a CSV file, okay? So all you need to do is you have this uh, read CSV and uh, we can, uh, Pandas will automatically read it in, and that was the data, okay? So you can actually use this approach for your lab two as well, because in lab two, the data file is again provided directly to you, okay? So you can just use that um, data file directly. Now, um, remember we also added some um, features, okay? So, um, we, instead of, um, you, when we actually did the lasso regression, we found that basically the prediction was already quite good uh, using melting point, boiling point, and square root x. So what we are gonna do is that, um, because we just want to demonstrate how kernel methods work, we are not going to use the full set of features. All that we are gonna do is that we are gonna use these three variables, which is the melting point, boiling point, and the square root of x, the uh, square root of the electronegativity, to um, predict our bulk modulus, okay? Now, to actually use the K nearest neighbor uh, algorithm as a regression technique, what you need to do is to import uh, the K, near, K neighbor the regressor from the scikit-learn neighbors. And um, the rest is basically um, model selection and metrics that um, mod, uh, functions, okay? so. Just to recap, because this is very important, you are going to use this extensively in your lab number two. Um, Cross-validate predict just means that I'm going to do some k fold cross-validation on the data, and then I'm going to use that cross-validated cross model to make a prediction, okay? Um, k fold just basically specific, uh, defines how you are going to do your uh, k fold splitting. Uh, metrics, okay? Metrics actually, the metrics package defines all the different types of metrics that you can use to assess your model, okay? So, I'm gonna, I want to go through that because um, in, your, in your lab number two, you are actually going to have to play around with the metric function, okay? So, in this package, there are many different types of uh, metrics. Now, one of the ways in which you can actually specify the metric is not to import the metric function, but rather just use a string, okay? So these are the common cases which are predefined in scikit-learn, right? So 
if you look at this, these are all the different kind of metrics you can use when doing either cross-validation or scoring. Okay? Scoring just simply means you are going to calculate a value of the model, which is then that value, that score, basically is an indicator of how good or bad that model is relative to your uh, test data or, or your cross-validated data. All right? So if you look at all these metrics, okay, you can actually use strings to specify them. So please remember that you can use uh, strings to specify them. Or alternatively, you can give it the function itself, but it's a lot easier to just use the strings. Right? So um, there are some metrics which are related to classification uh, problems. Right? So for instance, accuracy, this is by definition a classification metric. It is basically how many times do you get the accurate class versus the total number of um, observations, okay? So that is what's the accuracy score. You can actually click this in and this tells you. For example, accu accuracy classification score, in multi-label classification, this function computes the subset accuracy, basically the set of labels predicted for a sample that exactly match your corresponding set of labels in the true data set, okay? So, this is, this, this, this is uh, very easy for you to understand, right? If I have 10 data points and out of those 10 data points, I predict eight of them ac accurately, I have 80% accuracy, okay? So that's basically what the accuracy score is, right? Um, there are some modifications of the um, accuracy score. For example, you can also specify the accuracy score only for the top K, accu uh, top K um, predictions. You can also do what is called balanced accuracy score. Um, I'm not going to go through any of all those. I'm going to talk about the F1 score and everything else later. Precision and recall is also for classification. Now, uh, ROC, I'm going to talk about it later. But um, the one that you need to worry about for regression is all. So all these are for classifications. Okay? So you, you can see that there is actually a choice of the metric you want to use for classification scoring. There's also a um, score that you can use for clustering. Uh, again, that one I'm not going to go too much into, but I want to go through this in detail, which is what are the scores you would use for regression, right? Now, um, you will see that in regression, you can, uh, there's uh, what, what is called a negative mean, mean absolute error, negative mean square error. So this is exactly what you would think it should be is the negative of the mean absolute error or the negative of the mean square error. Now, why is it negative mean square error or negative mean absolute error? The reason is because in classification problems, you always want your accuracy values to be as high as possible, right? Uh, by definition, a 90% accuracy model is better than a 60% accuracy model, right? Now in regression, usually the way that we think about the problem is complete, the complete opposite. We want our error to be as low as possible. A mean square error of 0 0.1 is better than a mean square error of 0 0.9, right? So that definition is inverted. Now, in order to simplify the code, um, what scikit-learn does is that it takes the negative of the mean absolute error or the negative of the mean square error such that now your minimization of the error becomes a maximization of this score, right? So maximizing the negative mean square error is the same as minimizing the mean square error, right? So this is, these are the ones that you would th need to think about, all right? So um, in your lab two, I'm going to we are going to specify exactly which of these metrics you should be using to fit your model, and you have to choose the appropriate uh, metric uh, when you are fitting your models, okay? Um, so by default, I want to let you know is that if you don't specify any metric for your models, right, the default is the R squared, okay, which is the, um, which is the square that explains uh, variance of your uh, model, okay? So this is the R2 score, so this is the default. Um, 
and for for classificate the if the model you are fitting happens to be a classifier basically the default is I believe the accuracy okay so uh, and so you do need to specify because if you leave it to the defaults it may work but that would not be the answer that we are looking for right all right so I'm um, going back to our k nearest neighbor regressor uh, here I, I'm not going to bother to specify what uh, scoring function I'm going to use I'm going to just let the cross-validation predict automatically find the best um, k nearest neighbor algorithm. Um, I do, I'm doing a five-fold uh, cross-validation uh, prediction. Remember that uh, usually what we want to do is to uh, set shuffle equals to true, especially if your data was originally sorted in some form, right? So you don't want your data to be already in the pre-sorted form, and then when you do your k-fold splitting, that data is still in the sorted form, right? That actually uh, makes the prediction uh, very, uh, not very accurate, okay? Uh, or rather the fitting uh, very artificial. So, so we are going to shuffle the data. Uh, we are saying that when doing the careful splitting, they should pre-shuffle the data. Um, then uh, by, as I mentioned, by default, if you don't specify the um, model, okay, so let me, If you look at the uh, cross validate predict, if you look at the scoring, okay, so oops, where's the scoring function? Mm. Ah, okay, so we can go to cross validate score. Um, Usually, there's this uh, scoring function, and as I mentioned, if you do not uh, specify it by default um, for a classifier, it will be an accuracy score, and for, uh, for a regressor, it will be the R squared score, okay? So, um, other than that, um, everything else is uh, what you expect it to be. Uh, we are going to do a K nearest neighbor regressor. I'm going to just um, do the fitting. And then uh, this gives me my prediction for a uh, k nearest neighbor regressor. Um, it's not the performance is not particularly great. It didn't seem to be much better than what we have fitted before. All right. Um, the R square is only 0 0.46, and the MSE is uh, about 5,000. Okay. And um, the reason is also, of course, because we this is just the default value of the number of neighbors, right? So in scikit-learn, the number of neighbors is by default five. There's no reason why five is a good number. So typically when you want to um, figure out what the best value of k is, which is the number of neighbors you should be using, um, what you need to do is to, you need to fit a bunch of k nearest neighbor regressor with different number of k or number of neighbors, n neighbors, which is the number of neighbors you are going to take the average of, right? And uh, you keep scoring them, and then you fi figure out what the um, score should be. And what you see is that here I'm plotting the mean square error. So there is this function called uh, mean square error that actually calculates the mean square error between your predictions and your um, actual observed y. And what you see is that um, the optimal value of k is either 3 or 14, okay? That gives you the smallest average uh, mean square error. So um, what this means is that probably you want to choose either of these value. For me, I will personally err on the side of taking a larger average rather than taking a smaller average. So I wouldn't take, three, take just the average of 3 data points, rather I would take the average of 14 data points. Right, okay, and uh, that's basically it, right? <clears throat> now, um, so this is the optimal model using k equals to 14, and what you see is that the R square is around 0 0.5, uh, so slight, a slight improvement over your uh, default value of 5, uh, not by much, and uh, this basically is your predicted k versus your um, observed uh, k values, right? All right.
Now, um, so the other thing that, uh, so I'm going to talk now show you examples of how you actually sm uh, fit a smooth kernel to the data. Um, because it is actually very, right now we actually have three data points, right? We have a value of, um, we have a melting point, a boiling point, and the square root of the electron negativity as my input feature. Now, um, that means that if I wanted to plot that data by minimum, in, at a minimum, I need three axes, okay? And that's actually a bit hard to, um, to actually look at, the, uh, to, to, to actually uh, <coughs> plot or uh, visualize. So what I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna set the electronegativity at two. Two is like right smack in the middle of the electronegativity spectrum. So remember all your metals are closer to one zero po or zero point something for electronegativity. And all your anions like fluorine, oxygen are all like three point something, four point zero for your electronegativity, right? So two is so somewhere in the middle, right? So I'm gonna just set my electronegativity to be two. And then what I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna um, do a linear space. So again, this is another function that you need to um, remember. So numpy dot lin space basically just create a linear spacing of between the minimum melting point and the mi maximum melting point, and I'm going to create 100, 100 intervals in between, right? And that, those intervals will be equidistant, uh, right? Uh, same with the boiling point, right? And I'm going to create a mesh grid of the melting point and boiling point. What this simply means is that I'm going to create a grid. So this is my minimum melting point. So let's say it's 100 to 1,000 and I'm gonna create 100 data points in between. And for the boiling point, I'm gonna do the same. Let's say my boiling point is between 1,000 to 2,000. I'm also going to create 100 points in between. And what mesh grid does is that it basically creates this grid of data points such that I have all the x, y values at each of these uh, intersections, okay? So, um, very useful way of creating a grid of numbers, all right? And uh, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to set my uh, square root x, and I'm going to use my k-neighbor neighbor regressor to basically fit my melt, uh, fit my data. Now, of course, now my features are a bit artificial because I am setting my square root, uh, my square root of the electronegativity to be square root two, right? Uh, but uh, that's okay. We, uh, so in, in essence, what we are doing is that we are predicting the melting point and boiling point from my, uh, from our uh, actual melting, just from our melting point and boiling points. Okay. So um, you can go ahead and do the predictions and. Okay. Sometimes that uh, because the code changes from version to version and what happens is that they introduce all these warnings and then what, this, what happens is that these warnings then keeps happening and over and over again and which is why you actually have all those uh, noise, okay? You can actually suppress them. But this basically um, gives you a sort of a mapping of what is your value of K for a given melting point and boiling point. Right. So in essence, what I'm doing is that I'm fitting a k-nearest neighbor algorithm to my uh, melting point and boiling point, and this is the mapping that I get, right? So in other words, this tells me that if I am, if I have a material, if I have an element with a melting point of 500 and a boiling point of 1,000, my hardness should be somewhere between zero to 40, right? So this is my prediction. I'm not saying that the prediction is accurate, of course, the k neighbor algorithm isn't particularly accurate for this particular problem, but this is basically what my prediction is, okay? And um, similarly for the rest of the values. Now, one thing you will notice about this k nearest neighbor prediction is all the jagged edges, right? So you see there's actually all these uh, very, very jagged edges across uh, this uh, plot, and this is a consequence of the k nearest neighbor algorithm, right? In other words, we have, because we are taking just a simple average of my 14 nearest data point, so whenever I transition from one region where there is a data point to 
another just slightly across the boundary where I exclude that data point, that causes one of these uh, jagged edges. Okay, so this is basically what what happens, right? Now, you can actually very simply um, handle that problem, right? The k nearest k neighbor regressor also allows you to specify how how are you going to weight the data point, right? So. One way of weighting the data point is uh, using distance, right? So let me pull up the documentation. Now, if you look at the documentation for the k neighbors, um, the, deep, the thing is, the one thing that you always need to specify is the number of neighbors, okay? So the default is five. The weights, you can actually give it a uniform uh, distribution, which is what your simple k-nearest neighbor is, which means I'm going to assign equal weights to all the data points, regardless of how far they are from uh, the point I want to predict. Or I can use distance. Distance means that I'm going to weight the point by the inverse of their distance. In other words, my weighting function is going to be one over r, where r is basically the distance of the data point from uh, from the from the point I'm trying to predict. Okay. Now um, you can also specify what's called a callable. A callable just means that it is a function that calculates the distance given given your two feature sets. So using this, essentially, what you can do is that you can actually um, you can actually write a function that defines any kind of weight you want. Right. So. All the kernels that we talked about, uh, Gaussian or the Apatinikov uh, kernel, all those you can actually um, define a function uh, yourself to actually calculate the distances. Okay. Now, uh, <coughs> so if I do the distance weighting, so I'm weighting by inverse distance. Uh, this uh, the code is exactly the same. Otherwise, it's basically fitting. And then I'm going to look at what's the predictions, what the predictions are. And again, there's a lot of noise here. I'm going to skip all the way down. And this is basically what happens when you use the inverse distance as the weighting function. And what you'll notice is that um, at the very least, uh, some of the edges are smoothed out by a little bit. Okay, so. The, the, the reason why the smoothing is, not, um, is still not complete is, again, 1 over r doesn't guarantee that it goes to 0 at the edges. Okay? 1 over r uh, can still have a, a positive value at the edges. Okay? So there is still some discontinuity, but it does uh, smooth out a little bit. Right? Okay. Um, that's all for this uh, example. Any questions? 